Welcome to today's Icelandic Roots Public Webinar. Today's speaker is Margaret Wilson. Margaret is a cultural anthropologist living in Seattle. She's the author of Sea Women of Iceland and a new book called Woman, Captain, Rebel. Margaret's an adjunct faculty member at the University of Washington, and throughout her career, she has worked in different industries, including academia, the film industry, and the nonprofit sector. We're excited to have her here today to talk about her new book and her old book, and we hope that you enjoy it and have many questions. Thanks, Margaret. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, just, yeah, <laughs> I guess I'm talking now. This Zoom is always kind of difficult. You don't know if you're on or not, but um, I'm delighted to be here with all of you here in Icelandic Roots. It's, uh, Icelandic Roots is really important to this book, actually. But first to say that um, if you see me, I'm a bit strange how I'm sitting. Um, when I was in Iceland last time, crossing a street in a crosswalk, a car plowed through the light and hit me and broke my leg. Uh, so uh, it's healing nicely now. This I'm not, I don't need to be in the wheelchair anymore, but I, I still have it. So it actually works quite well here, <laughs> but yeah. I'm getting around on crutches. But, and so, I mean, you, we can say, you know, that when they sell performers, um, Oh, break a leg. Well, for me, I've already been there, done that, so we can just <laughs> ignore that. <laughs> but um, it made me think, it makes me think um, how just a chance, something that happens just by chance, like this, like this car, the guy couldn't, the sun was low. He said he didn't see me. If I hadn't jumped out, I sort of sprang out of the way. At the, and if I hadn't done that, I would have been killed. So, these some for all of us, I think something chance can sometimes, or what we might call chance, can be so transformative one way or the other. You know, I could have been killed. I have a broken leg. That's luckily healing. You know, and I think um, chance is also what led me to writing this book and my whole relationship with Iceland, because I'm not an Icelander, unlike most of you listening. But it was maybe, uh, it was over 20 years ago, I bought this house in Seattle, when one could afford to buy a house in central Seattle. And, but I was still just a beginning, you know, I was just starting professorship and all that sort of stuff. And um, I took, it's a big house, so I took housemates to pay my mortgage. And one of them was a woman from Iceland. And uh, at a certain point, she got an EU, she was an uh, oceanographic physicist, basically. And so she got an EU grant to do research in her native Iceland for a few months. And she invited me to come. And at that time, tourists were not going to Iceland. So it's about 2001. So, and I, of course, jumped at the chance and went there to visit her. She was showing me around as a good host would and took me to the small community of Stokseri, which is on the south coast of Iceland. And as we were wandering around the back streets, we came across, actually, um, do you want to put on the slides? Now I can actually use them. I'll show them now. Um, just go ahead and show the first one. Um, here's here's a cover of the book, which I think the publisher did such a beautiful job on. And then go ahead and do the next slide. Yeah. And so as we were walking um, through the back streets, we came across this um, hut. And it was a bit more disheveled then. But uh, and next to it was a, a plaque inscribed in Icelandic. And my friend, she translated, she read it. And it said 1949, and it said, this is a reconstructed winter fishing hut of the celebrated fishing captain, who lived from, and then, no, then it said, she lived from 1777 to 1864. And I thought, she? Uh, and I worked at sea myself. 
And we are always told there were no female sea captains in history pretty well, except for some pirates. And that experience changed my life, I will say, because then I went on this quest um, to discover about women working at sea in Iceland. I was working in Brazil, of course, really huge change. Um, but in order to, this book, this woman captain rebel, it is completely nonfiction and I have it cited, but it reads almost like a novel. And I want to explain since, you know, we, you get this background, something about why that was possible, because it's something I think is likely unique to Iceland. It's quite amazing. Um, go ahead and do the next slide. It was this. <laughs> so Iceland, as you all know, in this particular audience, is the home of the amazing Icelandic sagas, which have what inspired everybody from Tolkien to Game of Thrones or whoever. And then in the and Iceland had the first modern democracy of Europe, and then in the they lost that due to political infighting. And in the mid 1300s, were taken over by um, controlled by Denmark, and Denmark uh, took its rule very seriously. And then for 600 very long years, Iceland lived in incredible oppression. Starvation was always a problem, uh, a threat. Um, people in their homes, which weren't much better than that uh, sod hut that we saw, uh, they often didn't have heat because it doesn't have any trees. So there was fuel was always a problem. And they were controlled often on pain of death. They had to trade only with Danish merchants who could determine what quality of product and what price for everything that they got. At one stage, the Icelandic population went down to 25,000 people. But through all that, Icelanders kept their language. It's amazing. And they also kept their literature. Icelanders have said to me again and again that it's this sense of their literature based in the sagas that have kept their whole sense of self and heritage alive. Um, it, Iceland also had 100%, and because of this, it, it had 100% literacy rate. It probably wasn't exactly, but it was pretty close. It was much higher than anywhere in mainland Europe or anywhere else. Um, by the 1700s, by law, you had to be able to learn to read well enough to pass your catechism. Women weren't taught to write, but men were. And if they thought a woman was worth writing about, they did. But they wrote about everything. Um, these were just fishermen and farmers. So you had just, quote, common people who were totally impoverished. Everybody said that people, older Icelanders have told me when I've done interviews, um, that they may not have had enough food to eat, but everyone had at least one book. It's the most valuable thing they had. And so these people, they wrote about their neighbors, but they wrote about them as I realized, as I was beginning to um, go through all these old documents, they wrote about them really in the style of the sagas with this flair. So they wrote down verbatim conversations. They wrote down about love trysts. They wrote about betrayals. They wrote about scandal. They also wrote about fishing practices and about farming practices and, and folkloric beliefs, everything. So what you have in Iceland, which I, I to my knowledge, doesn't exist anywhere else because Iceland kept these papers um, unevenly. Some places they were destroyed by fire or flood or whatever, but you have this record of the common people that I don't think exists anywhere else. And that is why a woman like Thurda, who was very celebrated, she was amazing. And so all these people wrote about her. You almost, you, you basically never get this kind of detail 
on a woman's life in history. And so in Iceland, we actually have that. And so it's because of all those writings that I'm able to put down verbatim conversations. They are from the record. And they're often written by, I mean, they're almost all, they're always written by somebody who was there at the time. It's quite remarkable. Um, just, just to give you an idea, since we have the slides and everything, um, go ahead and do the next slide. So this is, for those of you who haven't been there, this is the shore at Stokseri, which um, actually, although the houses, of course, changed and everything, but the shore is very much the same. Uh, the seawall is higher. <laughs> Global warming, it, they have to make it higher. It's still, the sea will still get to the top of this. But what you notice is all these um, lava scaries that stick out into the sea there. And right beyond it, you have the open surf where um, large waves can very quickly build. And this, so a low tide, these scaries are out and they could, it was good for rowboats because the small rowboats they fished out of, fished with at the time, they could row between the scaries because they were deeper channels and then get out the shelf, um, the sea drops off very quickly. And so you could have these deep, cod fish that were um, deeper, diurnal fish, that they could wouldn't have to go very far to get really big fish. And then a lot of it was protected. Uh, now it's really unusable, but it was also very dangerous. And um, these scaries, at high tide, they're covered. And so it looks like a very deceptively calm sea. <laughs> very deceptive. Go ahead and have the next slide. So just so you can get an idea, these are fishing huts. These are later. This is painting by Bjarne Jonsson is from the 1890s. And they're much, the they've improved a great deal since Thurida's day that they now have a wooden upper story so people didn't have to sleep on the very cold bottom. Um, but it, the boats haven't changed much. And this is when they mostly fished, is in the winter because of migration patterns of the fish. And so this just is a scene that I think is, seems pretty accurate of what it was like going out in the winter. And let's have the next slide. And this is what it could be like coming in in rough weather. Um, again, the same painter, Beat Jonsson, who painted quite a bit about 19th century Iceland, which was wonderful for us to have. And then the next one. And this is the horror of what happened far too often with Icelanders. Um, we have the next slide. And Bjarne Jonsson also painted a picture of Thurder. Um, there is a drawing of her, but it was kind of, it's kind of sexist. It's not very good. But this one I think is lovely. So about her, when she was about 11, she first went to sea. This wasn't uncommon. Uh, women and children did go and work at sea very quickly when they were, because that's everybody needed to work. Um, but her first time out, she was known, she was shown to be remarkable at sea from the very first time. She could barely, she could barely be above the gunnels of the boat. She was quite small at that stage. But she quickly started pulling in fish after fish after fish. And of course, this was written about in detail by one of the deckhands. And so she pulled in these lines. It was a single line again and again. And so her father thought, well, he'd get her some fishing clothes right away. They all fished in these um, skin clothing. That was their only protection against the these freezing cold climate. You know, they're out there in the winter with nothing except the clothes. Um, but then it was interesting. By the time she was a teenager, um, mid-teens, she had already gained a reputation as incredibly observant and incredibly good at reading weather. So even by the time she was in her teens, uh, people started noting and after some incidences when she and her brother came in and other people didn't and to disastrous results, people began to follow her going out or coming in because she was so accurate. 
Um, she also in her teens, she started quite young, in her early teens, she started wearing trousers to see. This is in the 1700s. Women did that. Um, this was not unheard of at all because otherwise they were fishing in these long wool uh, skirts, which were horrible on the boats. And so quite a few, and it was acceptable for women to wear trousers at sea. But Thurida in her late teens decided she was also going to wear trousers on land. And she didn't disguise herself as a man. She just said they were more practical. She found them more comfortable. That's what she said. There was, to show you how the gossip is and, and the, how they write about it, they, she did wear a skirt for formal social occasions and to church. Although people commented that it, everybody thought she wore her trousers under her skirts when she <laughs> went to went to church. But, um, and then these are so detailed that you also get, there was this other guy named Yon, who was born seven years before her. And he, it, everybody was incredible, well, except for the small elite, everybody was incredibly impoverished. And it was almost impossible to get out of that poverty. But Yon Rich, he was called Yon Rich because against every possibility, he managed single-handed, it was single-mindedness to become rich, actually. He, and he bought himself a boat, astonishingly, which was very expensive because all imported lumber and everything, um, when he was 20, with the help of his mother, actually. And then he started going out fishing and he immediately being very ambitious, he wanted the person who was considered the best deckhand in the area. And that was third of it by that point. And so she was still, you know, he was in his twenties and she was in her teens at that point. And then due to various circumstances that, you know, I won't go into here, but um, she was fishing with her brother, but then, she ended up, he did get her as he got most things he wanted. And so once she was fishing with him, he consistently brought in the largest catches of anybody as his deckhand. Um, she also, his crew began to listen to her. I mean, she started telling him when to come in and go out, um, where to fish a lot. Um, she also, he wasn't very good with his crew, so she acted as a mediator, which the he ended up getting very, very reliant on her. So what I'll read a little bit, a couple of things to read for the book, but what I'll do is I'll read this just to give you an idea of the kind of detail um, that that this book, you know, that we are able to get because of these old records. And then none of this is made up by me. It's all from what people put. So this is just... I have bad eyesight, so I just hold it up. Sorry, you just have to get used to it. Um, this is just a day out fishing, basically. Um, okay. And it's with Thurida working for, who was then her captain, John Rich. She's about in her late teens. She's probably about 19, almost, maybe almost 20 at this point. Their captain, Yon Rich, soon arrived, and they dragged the boat across the rocks and into the water, joining eight other boats in the open ocean. Thurider, as usual, surveyed the weather. Good now, but unsettled, sure to change. Sure enough, a sudden strong wind soon sprang up. They pulled up their lines and rushed toward the nearby Etabaki shore before the surf rose. Everyone else did the same. Now, the Skerries at Edabaki, which is a fishing community right next to Stokseri, actually, and has a, the shore is very, very similar, um, lay in a parallel line out from shore, with boats entering a narrow gap between Skerries. Only one boat could enter at a time. As the waves got worse, Jan Rich's boat skimmed over the water at speed, one of the first to arrive at the channel entry. Thurida took note of the tide. Returning through the Erebaki Passage on an ebb tide was much more dangerous than a rising one. She nodded in satisfaction. Luckily, the tide was incoming. They pulled the boat from the water and paused to watch the other boats arrive. Six made it swiftly to shore, but two, with clearly weaker crews, lagged behind. Thurida glanced at her crewmates. Not good. 
surf was mounting fast, now cresting over the outer line of scaries. The lead boat, which held four people, entered the narrow entrance, veered in the churning backwash, crashed onto one of the outside scaries, and became solidly wedged against the rocks. No matter how hard they pushed with their oars, the crew couldn't get it off. Violent surf now smashed the boat back and forth against the sharp lava. They'd break up in no time. As Thurder and everyone else watched, a second boat close behind them intentionally now veered toward its own course directly toward the skerry. At great risk to themselves, they would try to save the stranded men. This was going to be tricky. Any overweight made a dangerous difference on these open boats, especially in rough waters. Unbalancing it could make it easily flip. Still, through buffeting waves, the crew members managed to pull two of the stranded men into the boat. But they'd now overloaded it, its gunnels riding barely above the water line. Any more weight would sink them. An impossible choice of who to say with no time for debate. They left the other two men behind. As the others rowed to safely, those two clung desperately to the damaged boat as it began to break apart, filling steadily with water. On the rising tide, the waves, the waves now crashed over the skerry and would soon submerge it. Then they drowned. Thurida glanced at her crewmate Gamlesan. They'd seen this tragedy too many times before. They all then looked at Captain Jon Rich. Any rescue attempt was his responsibility. He yelled at the other skippers. Aren't you going to give me people so I can get these men? The other skippers looked out at a sea increasingly white with froth, the scary a good 1,200 treacherous watery feet from shore. They shook their heads. Neither of the men on the rock were kin. They wouldn't take the risk. So no one did. Janrich shrugged and turned to his crew. He tried more than anyone else was willing to do. It's probably not a good idea to attempt to rescue those men from the scary, he commented. I'm not going anywhere. But either kept her eyes on the two men struggling to stay above the sea's greedy maw. It will be known to the authorities if you don't make an attempt to get those men, she said very quietly. Jan Rich, his, his other crew members stopped what they were doing and stared. Jan Rich jumped up and glared at Thurder. Then you take my job and be responsible for ship and crew, he shouted. Not that he expected her to take his angry invitation seriously. He should have known better. Thurder considered her captain's words. She assessed the risk, the distance, her crewmates. She nodded. I'll do it, she said to Jan Rich. I'll guarantee the safety of the crew. She paused, but I can't promise the same for your vessel. She looked at her crewmates. They looked from one to another. They'd go if she led them. Jan Rich gave her an infuriated wave and stormed up the bank. Thurider and her crewmates quickly pulled the boat back into the water and set off. With Thurider at the helm, they rowed rapidly through the spray, sliding alongside the scary in minutes. Then, balancing the boat, they dragged the two men aboard. Thurider ordered them to shove off fast. In an instant, they were rowing toward shore again. They'd done it, and they hadn't even damaged John Rich's boat. The following year, the authorities issued an award for bravery in the daring and courageous rescue of the two shipwrecked men. They awarded it to Janrich, who readily accepted it. So that gives you an idea of the, um, the detail. And those were written by deckhands, people who were with them at the time. So it's quite... You know, it's just amazing what Icelanders wrote at the time that I could then do this as a story um, and get the real feel of what it was like and her personality 
and who she was. Um, she, after this, um, the local pastor with whom she was very close friends, he had great respect for her. He managed to get a boat and Young Riches was an eight oar boat. Pastors was a 10 oar boat. And he asked the other to captain it. So she did. She accepted quickly, like it was about time. Uh, but Jan Rich was furious, absolutely furious. Not the less because uh, most of his crew members wanted to go and fish with her. She'd already selected a crew. She wasn't going to do that to him, but he was just furious. And for the rest of his life, he tried to destroy her. It's, it's just a campaign. It goes on and on and on and on. Um, because he now had to compete with her equally at sea. And now she very often got more fish than he did, usually did. Um, he, in her uh, reputation, just increased as a, as a captain and her abilities at observation and at mediation and her intelligence, it just increased. Um, and then in... 1827, the sort of unthinkable happened. There was there was this very small elite in Iceland of people who were very wealthy. And one of them, um, a fellow who lived at a camber farm, he was a wealthy farmer. And there was a home invasion robbery where people tied up the people there who were living there and stole this guy's hoard of money. This was unthinkable. Uh, the authorities were terrified. The Danish and elite Icelanders were terrified. And also sort of compounding this at the same time, very close to this timing, which I think you probably know about this, there was a murder or a double murder in North Iceland. And um, they, were, they were actually going through the court cases of that in North Iceland at the same time as this had occurred. So they talked about the French Revolution. Um, the elite were scared that Icelanders, the po completely impoverished Icelanders, were going to rise up and slaughter them in their beds or something. So they desperately wanted to find out who did this. But the elite people really knew nothing about the common people. And the common people were all related, as Icelanders tend to be. And so you didn't know if this was your kin. So nobody really wanted to help. But the county commissioner, whose name is was Thorther, which is quite like Thorther, but I have no control over that. So Commissioner Thorther, and he um, went, he was put ahead of this investigation. He couldn't figure anything out. So he went to Stuxeri, and Jan Rich had by now, in his increasing ambition, he'd made him, he got himself made into a deputy. So he was the sort of representative of the people there. And so um, Commissioner Thorther went to him and asked him if he had any ideas who might have done this. And Jan Rich didn't want to tell anything either, you know. So, but he saw a way he could get back at Thurder. And so he said to the commissioner, oh, well, no, I don't know anybody, but the most observant of any of us here is Thurida, Captain Thurida. So I suggest you go and talk to her. If she can't figure it out, no one can. So he screwed her, basically. So um, the commissioner knew Thurida wasn't going to help him either. So he laid a trap. Um, she would had a skirt on because it was a Sunday, but she changed out of it to go to work. So this is very briefly what happened and how she got roped into helping with this robbery. So they arrived at the very nice home where the county commissioner was staying and entered the parlor and greeted him. Commissioner Thorther greeted her in return, motioning the messenger and others hovering around to leave, although they didn't leave very far because they all recounted this. Glancing down at her tar-spattered jacket and trousers, 
Thurder told him that she'd been working. She'd been um, tarring her boat, which a good captain always did. Um, when his messenger rushed her to come without giving her a chance to sh change, which she'd asked him if he could, she could just take time to change. He said, no, 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 you have to come. Yeah, I should not have come before you dressed in this way, she apologized. The same goes for me as for others, Commissioner Thorther replied. I have heard before now that your everyday wear is men's clothing, but for that you need a license. Now, in reality, no such license exists. Um, I worked with copious Icelandic scholars, and there was no record of it. Um, in saga times, you there was penalty for cross-dressing. You could divorce someone if they cross-dressed. And there were other laws, but they were all finished about 12980. So there was nothing at this time. There's never any record that he gave her one either, by the way. But but it didn't make any difference. As county commissioner, Thorther could say whatever you like. He expected Thurther to be reluctant to help him. He clearly considered this and laid out his trap before she arrived. This license I will obtain for you, he now said, if you will give me a hint as to rob, who robbed the Camber farm. Effectively, the county commissioner gave Thurder no choice. She'd help him or he'd prosecute her for wearing trousers. Who was robbed and where? Thurder asked. He outlined the facts he knew of the robbery, including the items found at the scene, a tattered hat, an iron rod, and a dropped shoe. May I see the shoe? Thurder asked noncommittally. Uh, commissioner Thurder pulled the shoe out of a bag and gave it to her. Thurida turned it over in her hands, examining it carefully. The woman who made this shoe is highly skilled, she said after some consideration. It's been worked in a special way, which I have seen on only three farms. And where is that? Commissioner Thorther asked eagerly. This was unexpected. Was she going to give him a name now? With an impassive look, Thurida told him, that the first of these farms was his own. Commissioner Thorther flushed, unsure whether to be complimented at the skill of a woman on his farm, probably his wife, or to be insulted at the idea of someone in his household could have been associated with such a crime. Was Thorther being clever, mocking him, or making some kind of point? Of course, I personally think she was doing all three, but he decided on the defensive middle ground. True, he agreed, as if he knew such sewing details himself. But do you suppose that my men have been on such business? I do not suppose so, Thurida replied evenly. The second is from Gelderweyer, that's the pastor's farm. She paused, but I am sure the robbers are not from there. She then stood in silence. The county commissioner gave her a steely glare. Name the third, he said. So you have to read the book to know the third. Or you, many of you, some of you, I think, have already read the book, so you know. But um, it got very complicated very quickly. Uh, but it became, she, I mean, you know, being a sea captain, one of the most celebrated of her time was enough, but she also did all these other amazing things. Um, she realized at a certain point she could go to court um, on sort of, so she did. Um, when men harassed her for wearing trousers, or anybody did, she went to court, she won. She went to court on behalf of a woman who was abused by her husband. Um, she later actually went to court against the state um, to get um, support, medical support for her adopted niece. As you can see as she gets older how she gets more confidence and uh, more sophistication in her ability to do this. This is a woman she never was taught to read. She never knew, or she, sorry, she knew how to read. She was never taught how to write. Um, there's one scrap of her writing from when she was older, but very little. But she did dictate things to other people. So there exists in the archives a seven-page autobiography that she dictated. 
And there are several letters where she talks incredible metaphor. It's very hard to understand, but she was obviously very clever. Um, what I, I felt I did get to know her, you know, in a way, because there's just so much material and so much of her words, um, the things she loved. Um, she, she had relationships with three men. She didn't want to marry men, them because she didn't want to hand over that power. She said, well, we can live together until I decide that I want to be married because I don't want to give that power easily. That's very uncommon. <laughs> um, she was just, it, it's amazing to me that the things she was thinking and doing alone are very much what people are talking about today. And this was 200 years ago. Also, I find it amazing that as she got older, she stood alone against so much, as you imagine. She was very controversial. And people really loved her, but other people did not. Um, and yet, she, as she grew older, what comes through so much is with her intelligence, I think it's inner intelligence, is, is wisdom. And compassion and kindness it's, it's quite amazing people wrote about this when she was older how 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 much they she moved their entire lives even when she was like 80 uh, after she stopped being a fishing captain in when she was in her 60s she became a guide and <laughs> there's this great recounting of her with this really stupid guy <laughs> going over these trackless uh paths to meet somebody and all the details of that are there too so it's quite amazing um she was a very good storyteller so um i suppose we can look at you know what chance brings to us i mean i just by chance went to iceland 20 years ago and yet it has come a full circle to this incredible discovery of this amazing woman who I feel privileged that I was able to bring her existence more to life to an audience now that is basically forgetting her, even in Iceland. So I feel privileged. So that's it. If you have any questions. Oh, that was great. And thank you for the readings also. Uh, one question that I had, and I'll let people can now, if they want to ask questions, they can put it in the Q&A box and we'll, uh, we'll address those. But one question I had was, it seemed like she was so far ahead of her time that she didn't really break any barrier. She just kind of pierced a barrier herself. And maybe you could tell us a little bit about one thing that kind of surprised me about reading your book, Woman, Captain, Rebel, um, was that you remarked in there that the even though technology improved with fishing, that sort of left more women out. The gender roles were even solidified more, at least in the beginning. I wonder if you could just tell us about the types of fishing that took place in the 17th, I'm sorry, in the 18th and 19th century and how that changed and women's roles during those times. Yeah. So before the Woman Captain Rebel, I wrote a book which came out in 2016 which was Sea Women of Iceland, Survival on the Edge, um, where I looked basically at women in fishing throughout the history and to the present of that time in Iceland. And uh, what I discovered was very surprising. I never expected to find it. So many, so there were hundreds and hundreds of women, even thousands of women who fished in Iceland's history. Um, and of course, this was all recorded. We were able to find this. This is when I began to realize, my God, look at this amazing record. I certainly could not have written this book, I think, without having first done the research on the first one, because I needed that understanding of sort of the whole historical reality of Iceland to be able to then understand what I saw in the material that we found for this book. Um, the Icelanders rode in open boats to these subarctic seas in the winter 
the numbers who drowned and died is horrifying. I mean, I don't, you can't really get exact statistics, but it was thousands. I mean, it's sort of every family had somebody drowned. Um, there weren't enough people, I think, for them to be picky. That's what I've decided. But what I discovered was that a full third of the fishing fleet, a full third, in certainly 17 and 1800s, up to the mm, 1870s or so, 1880s, were women. And they were captains. 30 of the most is written about 30 there, but there were others. Um, there were helms women. Um, people who, women who were celebrated as rowers, women who were good at, at catching seals, particularly. Also, the, and they were applauded universally in the early writing. I see nothing, I saw nothing negative ever about their participation. But in the late 1800s, as Iceland is fighting more for its independence and, um, Ideas begin to change. I think there's probably a lot more influence from mainland Europe coming in then. And began there began to be this idea of the housewife, that a woman's role, even before, before that, they didn't really have the concept of a housewife. So everybody worked for survival and they were all living on these scattered farms. Um, but be, there began to be this idea of the housewife. So the, the, the idea of male and female roles became much less porous, I think you could say, than they were before. Um, so starting in the late 1800s, you start to see a shift in the records. And people, there's still, when people are trying to applaud, still, women are still working at sea, but when people are trying to compliment, they now start putting in things like, um, it was said she liked to be at sea even more than in the kitchen. Or, um, yeah, she was at good at sea as she was at knitting. I call them frozen. So they're trying, so they're tying them to the house at the same time as complimenting them at sea. At that time, in the later 1800s, Iceland didn't, in these open rowboats, they didn't start using sails um, until the late later part of the 1800s. Whereas lots of other countries use sails, but Iceland didn't. Um, so all it was all rowing until these late, and they, they just stuck the sails on these rowboats, so they were very, very unsteady. Um, then in 1900, Iceland goes through what people have called Iceland's version of the Industrial Revolution, and that was when they got motors on boats, and that was enormous, and the boats got much bigger. And that meant they couldn't be pulled ashore as they were. What they needed to do is come into harbors. And they could go out much further. And so they stayed out longer and they brought in much bigger catches at a single time. Um, so because they now had to come into harbors, instead of being scattered all along the shore and disparate farms, people began to congregate around these harbors where people would bring in the boats. And that was when you began to get the beginning of fishing communities in Iceland, an actual town. She didn't really have them before that, except Reykjavik was a town, but that was about the only one. At this time also, because they're bringing in so much more fish, they could no longer do what they'd done before, which is everybody fished, who fished, came in, and they all processed the fish. So all that labor was shared among everybody, and you got a share for your fishing. There was a lot of complication to that, but and it was an equal share between men and women. Um, starting in the early 1900s, you began to get wage labor because they could no longer, the people who brought the fish in could no longer do the processing. And that is when a huge shift occurred because the wage labor on shore, the processing of the fish became almost entirely female and the people going to sea who still got a share and made a lot more money was almost entirely male. So that's, it's not until the early 1900s that you see this, this um, huge division, gender division between men and women going to sea. 
And that's also when you see coming in from your superstitions, they don't come until the early 1900s that women were bad luck on boats and all these sort of things that had been rampant in Europe for a long time. They only came to Iceland at that point. And then there are all these derogatory comments start about females who are working at sea. So that's the big shift. It is a very dramatic. But it, and, so, and then after that, Iceland totally erased its history of these amazing women working at sea for centuries. They were images as male, as it is today. When you say they erased, but in, in what they just left them out of the history books and the descriptions yeah. and yeah. 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 And all the public sort of anything, Iceland, you look at the museum, you know, everything. It's all male. Yeah. Uh, I wonder also if you could tell us a little bit about um, how her life, her early life. I know her father had leprosy and, and she lived at home until she was 25. That struck me as a little unusual. Maybe not if she's in a fishing family. I don't know if you and if she's a good uh, fisher person, then maybe they needed her around for on the farm to help with the fishing. But maybe you can comment on that a little bit. Well, people would have stayed at home if they had, if people had a leasehold on a farm, very few people owned farms, and it was quite hard to get a leasehold. You had to have at least, well, one cow or three cows, depending. And that was far too much for many people to be able to manage. Um, so if you were, if you weren't able to get a leasehold, then by law, you had to be tied to a farmer as a, a farmhand by law. And that farmer then became your master. So the system was very much like serfdom, actually. And you could only change farms once a year on what they called moving days. And that farmer had the ability to even tell you when you could, to the ability, you couldn't leave the farm without his permission. So, and and that was the the elite, the people who controlled Iceland, put in this system to make sure they had a ready supply of really cheap labor. You weren't allowed to marry unless you could have a leasehold. Um, they didn't want an increase in population. Of course, then people got together and had children outside marriage. I mean, you're not going to stop people from getting together, but that was the plan. And so people, if you had a leasehold, then you would stay there until some opportunity were to come up. And that for women, that might be marriage, but in very not that many women married because it was too hard. Yeah. So, um, so it was as long as that farm could support you, you would stay there. So it wasn't unusual at all um, because your only other choice was to go and be under somebody else's control as a farmhand. So well, in her well. case, she was very productive. So she helped bring in the bacon for the her parents' farm, I would imagine. And she uh, did. And then she could stay. And yeah, that's great. Well, it was it was later. I mean, she was able to be independent. Well, she still had to work as a farmhand mm -hmm. when she wasn't at home, but certainly she was very valuable on her family's yeah. farm. Um and why there was a lot of conflict later on when her brother brought in, uh, when he married, his wife didn't like her having so much power on the farm. So it was a conflict there. Uh, you, you survived a lot better if you were lucky and they had a, they had a four or boat. And that was incredible. However, her father ever got that, I don't know, but that we were in much, much better situation. So after the, you know, the, eruptions in 18 i mean in 1783 84 your chances of survival were astronomically higher if you had a boat other people a huge number died but if you had a boat and could get fish you could at least have something to eat so it was a huge advantage that is true and that's why the the danish and the elite in iceland they didn't really they didn't like the fishing communities like Stokseri and Erebaki, which were at that time for Iceland were quite densely populated. And 
they didn't like them because they were much harder to control. Um, a lot of times you had to fish for the church or a landowner, but if you, it was one of the only ways that you could actually make your own income in Iceland at that time. So, and so they couldn't totally control them. So they didn't like them, actually. They'd rather have them working as a farmhand and then also working as a, on a boat. And that means you, you still got your share, but it would then go straight to the farmer. You didn't, women got, they got an equal share, but then they got less food and clothing than men did for that. So they didn't feel they could control as much. They didn't like it very much. So interesting. One, uh, this is more of a research anthropology question. But, um, tell us a little bit about the process you used with, with reading these old documents, the 18th century Icelandic script, people writing in different handwriting. Um, how were you able to, to break through all of that to, and you know that, that non non uh, non standard spellings and all sorts of things that probably got in the way of understanding what was being written. Let's I I didn't. Let's be truthful. Um, so we got a, quite a few of them had already some of them had already no, the first research I did on this and with the earlier Sea Woman book the, the earlier Sea Woman book didn't have any archival trans um, archival documents it was all stuff that had been dis transcribes and was actually in the library. Um, so there's these old dusty volumes from the late 1800s and very early 1900s that were in the library that had, and that was amazing to me because they have like Saga Stokseri, which is this history of Stokseri written by incredible detail. And that is other people have transcribed those in the past. But for the book on Thiri, there, um, in all of this, my research assistants, of whom there were many, were invaluable. It could never, I could never could have done it without them. But for the documents, um, and of course, my Icelandic vocabulary began to be very heavily weighted in terms of sort of 18th and 19th century words, like neither set in good, which I, my younger research assistants don't know, which I was quite happy they don't know. That means a totally impoverished pauper or an omai who was a person who was um, sort of auctioned off to the lowest bidder to be sort of a, essentially a slave. It was a horrible situation. So I'm glad those are going out of the vocabulary because it means something about the difference in Iceland today. But for the documents, um, I hired one, for some of them I hired for some court documents because I went through all the court documents as well. Um, I, I hired um, a student who is specializing in those documents because normal Icelanders cannot read those documents either. And so you have to find a specialist. And the official ones were kind of in a mix of Danish and Iceland, this Icelandic, and he couldn't read Danish really. So I had to get somebody else to help with the Danish. And so it was. It took a lot of work. One of my research assistants also wrote spoke Danish. She got much better at reading the documents as time went on. I hired another research assistant. She and I just spent weeks and weeks and weeks in the archives, and we just went through huge boxes. The people at the archives were wonderful. Just huge boxes of these documents, going through page by page and scanning them for the word thudu, actually. And then we photographed them, and then we examined them later on. And just I have in fact I have a whole bunch that haven't been transcribed yet. There's more on her that I don't even know. It's like you have to finish at a certain point. And that's the thing of research <laughs> we know, right? So, but for her letters for the most difficult ones, I was I'm incredibly grateful to um specific Icelandic scholars such as Mauri Jonsson, who's an historian. And he's a specialist in 16th century documents. I mean, he was He's amazing. And uh, he very generously, he just transcribed several of them for us. And then there's another woman, and actually a Canadian, um, Katie Parkin. She's, Parsons, she's, um, 
She's from Gimli area and she's um, lived in Iceland for some years and she's done her PhD looking at old documents. And so she helped me. Various people helped me in Iceland. But there's no way I can. I just strip flat out. There's no way I could read them. No, yeah. I could make out a word now and again, but they're impossible. They're very, very hard. Yeah. yeah and I know now there's a uh, different AI programs which read 18th and 19th century Icelandic text. Hopefully those will get better and uh, help anthropology with its uh, work. That would be amazing. Yeah. That would be amazing. Yeah. But we have a couple minutes left. Is there anyone who has any last questions they want to ask? I'll keep it open. But nobody has any questions at all. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you've been a, a frequent guest for Icelandic Roots and maybe all their questions have been answered. Um, <laughs> but I found your work uh, really fascinating and I, I loved the writing style and how you wrote it almost like a novel. And I'm so glad that you talked about that because I was like, is this is this, fic is this a fiction or is this a reality? But it turned out that um, all of the conversations and the interchanges were based on actual documents and correspondence I think that that's that's great I'll say something more on that it was really interesting because I actually first started writing this as a novel I wrote a whole third of the book as a novel those of us who you know writing books you, you you always go through several renditions before you get and it was after that it just didn't feel right it just wasn't flowing mm -hmm. and I realized my discomfort was in part I was, I didn't feel I was being fair to the or women in general, because then people would just say, well, this isn't true. And then I also thought, well, I'm just paraphrasing what's here already. And so then I took this dive. I thought, you can do this with the material you've got. It's amazing. And it took, and this is where Icelandic Roots was very helpful because we used the Icelandic book, you know, the Icelandic um, database, but we also used um, Icelandic okay. Roots, yeah, as you know, because I had to put a huge database together, a genealogy of every how everybody was connected mm -hmm. because otherwise you never could figure out the power structures or anything. Mm -hmm. So um, again, that really helped because Iceland has that. So um, I then felt, I mean, I I was very ha happy with the publisher because this is a trade publisher. It's not an academic publisher or anything. It's just a trade publisher mm -hmm. where they want to make money. And they agreed to also put, it's 60 pages of notes. That's a lot more expensive for them to do. And they agreed to do that because they agreed that they felt it was important to also to make sure that people could see that it actually is historical documents. It is, it is, is nonfiction. Yeah. So that's great. yeah, it's amazing. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. It's been really informative for me. And um, I enjoyed also reading your book. Uh, and I hope others will read Woman Captain Rebel because it is, it's more than um history it's a very dynamic story almost like a historical novel and uh and so we i'll just say it. one thing it was reviewed in historical fiction they reviewed it they included it i went what <laughs> just because they said that they said you know even though this is non-fiction we're including it because it reads it has such a world to it, it does, uh, yeah it's really great so thank you so much and uh we we hope you write more books about iceland and can come back on our show <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, thanks for inviting me. It was it was great. I enjoyed it. Bye bye.